Hey guys, it's Thorin, and this video has kind of been a long time coming. I've had several people ask me for it in the last uh, month or so as I've posted more both here on YouTube and on Instagram about which books. I've written and spoken a fair bit about um, best beginners books, and I've been reviewing new books. I posted a review of Harmony Nice's Wicca. Um, just last week, and the response that I'm getting generally is that we need a, a list kind of of classic books. What are the books that someone would need to have read in order to have a good sense of contemporary witchcraft as a movement? Like if we were defining the boundaries kind of of cultural literacy in witchcraft, what should you have read? Because I've been making a lot of statements about good beginner books versus bad beginner books, uh, books that are worth reading, books that aren't, kind of the, the shift in which culture in the last couple of years and the divide between older witches and younger newcoming practitioners. And from my perspective, what are the books that people need to have been exposed to on some level in order to um, have a comprehensive picture of what's going on in our communities. So I went through my shelves and I'm going to show you what I came up with. I'll probably write an accompanying blog at some point, but for now, here's a video. I've kind of loosely divided these into categories. Uh, they're, they're mostly chronological, not entirely. I'm kind of thinking of them more in terms of movement. Okay, so here we go. And I'll preface this by saying that this has nothing to do with your individual tradition. If you are Wiccan, if you're a traditional witch, if you identify as a secular witch, if you're just interested in neo-paganism or magic, these are texts that if you are occupying witch spaces, that these are the ones that are mentioned the most, these are the ones that are the most influential, these are the ones that I personally feel, if you're going to claim to be knowledgeable about, about a movement, these are books that you should know. Whether or not you've read them cover to cover, uh, these are all books that deserve your time. Um, second caveat, this is not to say that I endorse all of the ideas in every book. What we're considering here is impact in a movement, not just is the book good or is the book good for teaching you how to be a witch today. A lot of these aren't. A lot of these are not books that I would reach for for somebody who was just starting to practice. Um, but they're books that you should read eventually. How about that? Okay, and I'll just say a couple about each. I've got probably, I don't know, probably 12 or 13 books here. Um, so let's roll. Okay, again, loosely chronological, but not really. Um, first off, The Meaning of Witchcraft by Gerald Gardner. This is the second text openly about witchcraft that he writes, and it's the one that a lot of traditional Wiccan groups are going to point you to if you're interested in their traditions. Gerald Gardner is a terrible writer. Okay, that's just objectively true. But his ideas are still some of the most prominent in witchcraft communities, even when people don't realize that what they're doing is actually Wicca, and Gardner wrote about it. Um, so this one is worth your time. Okay, Meaning of Witchcraft is more comprehensive than Witchcraft Today, which is why I'm picking Meaning of Witchcraft instead of Witchcraft Today. Um, this is the one where Gardner is really, he's writing more from an inside perspective as opposed to like, oh, look at this thing that I stumbled onto, look at it, sensationalism, tra-la-la. Um, so this one is worth your time, okay? Uh, from here, you can't talk about Gerald Gardner without talking about Dorian Valiente, okay? Um, if she was mentioned in the Harmony Nice book, she would be basically the mom of Wicca. Okay, um, and she is. This is Witchcraft for Tomorrow. Dorian Valiente has a number of really excellent books to choose from. This is my personal favorite. Uh, so Doreen is responsible for a lot of the poetry that we see floating around in witch spaces. Um, things like The Witch's Rune and 
um, Charge of the Goddess, and variations on some of these really prominent Wiccan pieces. A lot of them come from Doreen. Um, she added a lot of the poetry to what Gardner was doing and made it more palatable for more people, particularly women. Totally a badass. She went on to work with Robert Cochran and she did lots of other really badass stuff. Um, Phil Philip Heselton speculates that she was a spy during World War II, which is pretty rad. So I'm not sure I buy that, but I choose to believe it, <laughs> okay, um, just because it makes her cooler. Um, so if you want to get into Valiente, again, if you're more interested in traditional Wicca, this is a great place. Can't read anything about witchcraft really at all without looking at Charles Leyland and Aradia, Gospel of the Witches. Again, a lot is coming from Aradia uh, without people necessarily knowing that that's where it's coming from. My favorite is the passage about how we all need to be rising up against the rich. Okay. Um, but anyway, um, it's designed as kind of this messianic tale about... Um, basically a witch queen who appears and kind of leads humanity and uh, anyway Leyland claimed to have met to have met a hereditary witch and to have learned his information from her um, but whatnot anyway a lot of Gardner Valiente a lot of really prominent early writers had read Leyland and were referring to Leyland so uh, Raven Gramassi relies really heavily on this text a lot of people claiming um, Italian which ancestry are looking at this text? So, Aradia. This is um, this is the edition from the Witch's Almanac. There are a number that are available. This is one of the better ones. Okay, worth your time. I'm gonna stop saying that because all these are worth your time. Paul Hewson, Mastering Witchcraft. Okay, um, if you are interested in traditional witchcraft, this is the book that's gonna get cited over and over again. For Hewson, witchcraft really exists in a Christian context. Uh, there's a lot in here about, you know, reading the Mass backwards and that kind of thing, reciting the Lord's Prayer backwards and declaring you're a witch and that kind of whatnot. Um, a lot of contemporary Wiccans and pagans hate this book. Um, I, I think it's great, um, but there's definitely that sensational sort of element that's going to piss some people off, but it's definitely a cornerstone text for traditional witches. If you're operating in a Luciferian context, or you're interested in folk magic, or this idea that um, witchcraft is this thing that stands in contrast to Christianity, kind of like these warring traditions, Paul Hewson is critical. And if you want to operate in and understand traditional witch groups, this is, uh, this is something to have in your back pocket. This one, thankfully, still floats around on Instagram, and I think it's because it has a cool cover. This is A Witch's Bible by Janet and Stuart Farrar. Um, this is an older edition, so it's called A Witch's Bible Complete. Um, if you've seen any of my book videos, you know I have about five copies of this book. I actually was opening it to grab, um, to decide what, uh, what books to do in this video, and one of my jackass initiates tucked this in there. This is the real copy. It's the lineaged copy. So of all of my copies, this is the only real witch's Bible worth reading. So if you don't own this exact copy, then too bad. It's not real witchcraft. I'm kidding. Um, anyway, Janet and Stuart Farrar are Alexandrians. Um, so again, this book is from a traditional Wiccan perspective. It's actually a combination of several books. Um, so there's a section about um, the Sabbaths. There are a ton of rituals in here. This is great for kind of figuring out what you're going to be getting into if you start investigating traditional Wicca. Um, some people will find it off-putting just because it can be a little bit dry. It was, you know, it's an older book, um, but... The youngsters seem to still be at least buying this one, if not reading it, so good for them. Moving forward, kind of into more eclectic land. Um, Wicca by Scott Cunningham, A Guide for the Solitary Practitioner. This is one of the first books that comes out that says that Wicca is something that you can practice as a solitary. It's something that you can learn about in books and kind of follow your heart and assemble your own rituals and build a relationship with the god and goddess. This book is 
revolutionary and it's one of the best-selling books on Wicca ever published ever. Um, I've written I've written and talked about this one before. I don't think a lot of these titles hold up. Okay, I said that at the beginning. Uh, this one in particular, but if you want to have an understanding of how people practice Wicca today, you need to read Scott Cunningham because even the people who say that they don't like him are often citing his stuff without realizing it and doing very Cunninghamian kind of things. Okay, he's really important. Prior to the Cunningham book, we have Buckland's Complete Book of Witchcraft, affectionately titled Uncle Bucky's Big Blue Book. Okay, there are a couple of editions floating around. This book is really the first that comes out and says, hey, you can be a witch without being in a coven. Here's a manual showing you how. Famously, we joke, there's a chapter in here about forging your own athame, which I'm pretty sure literally nobody has ever done, according to this book. Um, but way to go, Ray Buckland, for encouraging us. Um, it's set up as a workbook. And again, this is one of the best-selling books, like, ever. Um, I think a lot of it doesn't hold up, okay? It's not necessarily what I'm going to hand to people today. But if you want a working knowledge of how people practice Wicca today and where that comes from, you have to read Rib Buckland. So there's that. Ditto Silver Ravenwolf, okay? To ride a silver broomstick, love her or hate her. It's really hard to participate, particularly in online communities, without at least knowing who she is and having a sense of her work. Um, this is probably her cornerstone text. Um, it's not my favorite of what she's done, but this is the first book in her New Generation Witchcraft series. Um, came out in the mid-90s, I think. 97, maybe? I don't know. Um, anyway, again, kind of a manual. Uh, 93, early 90s, excuse me. Um, kind of a manual of where to go, what to look at when you're interested in Wicca. Ravenwolf is famous for her candid, kind of personable tone. Um, she's really a pleasure to read, kind of even, even whether or not you agree with her necessarily, there's something that's just really relatable about her style. I've always loved it. Um, stuff, some stuff holds up, some stuff doesn't. Um, this book made a lot of people really upset, but it's, it was also wildly selling. Um, this is one of those books that most people have on their shelves and there's an awful lot of people who act like they hate her but they're still reading her books okay because she still she still sells. Um, so she's worth she's worth checking out if for no other reason then you need to understand why she's such a controversial figure. Okay if you really hate her and you don't want to support her that's fine like buy the book used. Go to a library those are still a thing. Isaac Bonowitz, Real Magic. Um, so Bonowitz is famous for a lot of things, okay, but one of them is uh, he's, he's one of the first people who gets a degree. He claims, he claims to be the first, I think, is the original story. Gets, a, gets an actual bachelor's degree in magic. Um, I think it was actually a liberal studies degree. I don't actually know the story, okay, but this is essentially um, a write-up of a lot of what he was doing when he was in school. Um, so it's got kind of a drier scholarly tone to it, but it's not a, it's not a scholarly book. Um, but this is purely about magic and how contemporary magic works. It's not about witchcraft per se. Um, Bonowitz went on to do a lot of things. He was involved in Wicca. Um, he was one of the leaders of Andriacht Fenn. That's ADF. It's a druid organization. Um, so he is extremely influential in all of our communities. Um, this one is worth checking out if you're just interested in kind of spells and how magic works and um, magic for personal development and just generally magic and how it works. This is, this is the one you want. Okay? Again, it's one of those books that a lot of people don't read directly, but they are sort of inadvertently citing Bonowitz, even if they're not aware that that's what they're doing. Okay. Ah, such a pile. We're almost done. It's fine. The Spiral Dance by Starhawk. Um, so Starhawk is at the fore of feminist witchcraft. There's a period where she's identifying as Wiccan, but those words kind of fall away and eventually there's this crowd of women who are identifying as witches. And this is a very, um, it's a matriarchal style of witchcraft. Um, 
Many practitioners are interested in the goddess over the god, um, Starhawk, and Z Budapest, and some of the Diane Baker, some of the other women who are writing at this period are interested in claiming the divine feminine. If you're interested in the triple goddess and um, the idea of, of the divine mother, a lot of these ideas are coming from Starhawk. This book is also famous for its rituals, which are beautiful. Um, again, one of the, this is 1979, um, one of the most influential texts in our movement. Um, parts of it hold up, parts of it don't. I'm not personally a big Starhawk person because I'm not a big um, goddess movement person, okay? Um, but that's fine, that's just me. You still need a reader. Ed Fitch, A Grimoire of Shadows. A lot of people don't know that this is even a book, uh, particularly today. But this book is great because Ed Fitch is responsible for producing a lot of the material that comes to be outer court Wicca. Uh, a lot of people complain that paganism is really just Wicca. Like, why is it when I go to a pagan open ritual, it's kind of just watered down Wicca? Well, be my friend, it's because a lot of the material that's incorporated into wider pagan movements, co uh, rituals, comes from Wicca specifically. And a lot of that is thanks to Ed Fitch, who is producing material for folks who want to be involved in witchcraft or Wicca, or they want they want to be part of a pagan tradition, but they don't necessarily want to be a priest or priestess in a coven. Um, a lot of these rituals by Ed Fitch in this book circulate in pagan communities like they just were born out of the air. Um, people don't know that they're using Ed Fitch material, um, but this book is basically all rituals. There's rites of passage. There's Sabbath information. Um, spells, a lot of this has to do with building a community group that incorporates children and incorporates kind of the, the rites of passage that we go through as we age and makes witchcraft applicable to real life. Um, so Ed Fitch is one of those guys who's kind of in the background of everything, but people don't always look at him real closely. Um, his material is, is ubiquitous, but a lot of people don't, don't know who he is today, which makes me sad. Two more. Okay, and um, I could have kept going, but this is almost a 20 minute video, so we're gonna muscle through it here. Power of the Witch, Lori Cabot. Uh, first of all, side note, personally, this book taught me how to meditate. Okay, I can still do that apple meditation in my sleep. Thanks, Lori Cabot. Um, Lori Cabot, the official Witch of Salem. Look at this amazing author photo on the back of her walking away down a Salem street being a badass. Um, anyway, this book is a, a comprehensive system for studying magic, learning to be a witch. Um, obviously, Lori Cabot is uh, the founder of the Cabot tradition, so you'll hear, you'll hear talk of Cabot witches. Uh, the guy from Godsmack famously was a Cabot witch. I don't know what happened with that, uh, but whatnot, Godsmack. Sully Erna, Sully Irma, Sully, Sully, I don't know, with a big belt buckle. That's how you know he's a witch. Um, anyway, uh, lots of really good exercises in here. One of the reasons Lori Cabot is important, aside from just being amazing, is that she gives us Christopher Penzak. Okay. Um, Inner Temple of Witchcraft. This book came out, was it early 2000s? Fifth printing, 2006. I don't know when that was. 2002. That's when we're talking. 2002. So not too long ago, although 2002 was almost 20 years ago, because I'm old now. Um, Christopher Penzak goes on to again be one of the most influential pagan writers pretty much ever. Uh, he is one of the best-selling authors that Llewellyn has, if not the best-selling. I don't know at this point. Um, I hear that he has a special shelf in the Llewellyn building dedicated to how badass he is. And he is, in fact, badass. Uh, this is the first book in the Temple of Witchcraft's training series. It represents a year and a day of study. And each chapter takes you through some aspect of learning how to be a witch. Uh, this is another one of those books that you will see everywhere. It's extremely influential. Um, one of the things that's cool about Christopher Penzak is there's a lot of there's a lot of Wicca in here, but he's he's inspired by by the Cabot tradition. That's his background, and he's 
doing other things kind of based on his own explorations and building a tradition out of it, which is pretty cool. Um, so this book particularly is about developing your inner temple, okay? So meditation and um, working with energy and that sort of thing, okay? There's not a lot of like correspondences and spell casting and that kind of stuff yet, uh, but it's part of a series. So hugely influential, um, even with young witches today, you'll still see Penzac, so that's great. So here's an ass ton of books and a 21 minute long video about why they're important and why you should read them. So that, my friends, for you is your lesson in cultural literacy in witchcraft. Again, not all of these are books that I would just flat out recommend to a beginner, but they are books that I think that as part of your education generally as a witch, these should be in your arsenal. Whether or not you agree with them, it's kind of like it's kind of like the Bible is literature, right? So as an English major, you read the Bible. It's part of what you do. And it doesn't mean that you're a Christian or a Jew or whatever, but you read the Bible because as, as an American, as somebody who is part of kind of the Western European academic tradition, you need to understand what people are talking about in order to operate in, in, this, in this kind of climate. Um, sort of like that. You need to have a working knowledge of Shakespeare. Doesn't mean that you have to like theater, okay, or that you have to be able to quote it, but you need to kind of have a general idea of what's going on. Okay, so the Bible, Shakespeare, Silver Ravenwolf, same thing. Okay, anyway, um, hope you guys are well. Leave a comment. If you've got a book you think I missed, please put it below and shoot me a follow on Instagram. I do book reviews every week and... I hope you guys are having an excellent day.